It's nice to see you, everybody. I wasn't, you know, when, when I was looking at the weather report, I wasn't sure if you guys would show up, but, but you did. How many of you are excited about seeing the, the uh, snow on the mountains on Wednesday? Yeah. Woo! That is one of my favorite parts of living here. Yeah. Wow. Seeing it and not living in it. Yeah. Amen? Because yeah. I went to school in Chicago, and it was a little different. So I remember some days going to class, and, and the weather report said, don't. And we had to go to class anyway, because our teachers were mean. And I, I had a mustache, and it would get icicles in it. Like, on the way, to, it's awful. Anyway, <laughs> I love California. OK, so uh, we, uh, last week we talked about fellowship, as I mentioned. And I shared a very helpful graphic that illustrates what a lot of the New Testament is about, uh, borrowed from the great state of Texas. Um, but uh, a lot of the New Testament is not written to you. It's written to you all, or all y'all, all of us. So in order to understand and live out the New Testament, we need each other. That's God's whole plan is for us to walk this life out of faith together. And, uh, and so I want to I commend you, Caneo Church, because I've seen uh, the last few months this uptick in fellowship. So the women's brunch went phenomenally well, the men's breakfast Yesterday, a bunch of you guys came, and there's like some new blood, some new energy. Uh, the community groups seem to be off to a great start. Uh, in fact, in the lobby is a sign-up sheet for community groups, and I just want to encourage you, if you're not part of one, to become part of one. And so Wednesday nights, uh, Camarillo and uh, Thousand Oaks, Thursday night in Moorpark, and this week... Uh, Ryan Mayfield's group gets started. You can talk to him if you want to join that one. And then in a couple weeks, the Thurmans are starting, and they're, they're going to each reach out to you this week and let you know what the plan is, okay? So, um, yeah, please take that seriously and sign up in the lobby. So we've been in a series on Acts chapter 2, which is hands down my favorite chapter in the whole, uh, whole Bible. I was going to say New Testament. I think the whole Bible. I mean, Joshua 1 is like a really close second, but man, Acts 2 is amazing. And uh, I wanted, uh, it made me think about a video that I saw this last week, so I wanted you to watch this video. And this, you know, sometimes um, we, we want to learn what not to do. This, this video is kind of a what not to do in fellowship. Imagine a church where every member is passionately, wholeheartedly, and recklessly calling the shots. I have a busy work week, and by the time Sunday rolls around, I'm tired. So how about a church service that starts when I get there? Can do. When you arrive, we begin. This guy, he plays by his own rules. We want to find a church where if he starts screaming, we're not the bad guys, right? Come here. Say no more. If your baby's screaming, you stay seated. The others around you can leave. You know, financially, Sherry and I don't give a lot to the church but we'd sure like to know who does. All right, if you join now, you'll know what every person gives in detail. When I'm in the church service, can my car get a buff and a wax? Not just that, but an oil change and a tune-up. Hey, how about tickets to the Super Bowl? That's asking too much. I'm serious, if I'm gonna join, I want tickets to the big game. All right, you join now and we'll get you there. I like a pony. Look in your backyard. Me Church, where it's all about you. You know why that's funny? Because it like pokes at the truth about us as Americans, right? We're like, man, that church, that does it for me. Woo! But Acts is really how are we part of his church, yes. right? Amen. And how are we together, the church, not how does the church meet my particular need? Now, now that's part of it, but man, that is not the whole thing. Amen? Amen. So uh, I want to ask you to stand as I read our passage for today. And uh, you guessed it, it is Acts 2, 42 through 47. But this time, I thought it might be neat if we did a little uh, audience interaction and so I'm going to point to this section first. You're going to give us the first verse. You're going to give us the second verse, and then the third verse, and then the fourth verse, 
And then I'm going to go back this way to the fifth verse and the sixth verse. Okay? Got it. Are you with me? Sort of with me? Okay. So we're going to start over here. One, two. This is verse 42. One, two, three. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Okay, that's good. Now it's your turn. Everyone was filled with awe and the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. Okay, that's good. They sold ready, and possessions and gave to anyone as he had need. They didn't like that whole idea. Okay. And then here we're verse 46 every day. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And this is us. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. You can grab a seat. So, sorry, I, I didn't realize that the computer program didn't give us the verses. But you did well. You, work, you worked it out as a team. So, today our subject is the third of the things that they were devoted to. So, you'll notice it says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, or the prayers. So today we're going to be talking about breaking of bread. We're going to figure out what does that phrase mean, and we're going to talk about what does it mean to be devoted to that. So breaking bread in the New Testament, uh, it it really meant two things. The first one is communion, which we would kind of assume, okay, that's right. And then the second thing is the common meal. So when the believers got together, they would share common meals often, and what was part of their common meal a lot of time? Communion. Communion. So often these things traveled together, and, and so uh, a common meal would often start with someone, the host, breaking a loaf of bread, serving it to everybody. Then they would eat dinner, and then at the end, they would share a common cup, or they would pray over all of their cups and remember the Lord's gift for them. So some commentators say that verse 42, where it says they were devoted to the breaking of bread, that one's just about communion. Because verse 46 says that they broke bread in their homes, and that one's just about common meal. But I really think, big picture, that the the Lord is saying, be devoted to these things together. Be devoted to communion. Be devoted to sharing meals with each other. So let's talk about um, different terms for communion. So raise your hand if you grew up Catholic, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Anybody else? Baptist? Non-denominational? Assemblies? Four square? Okay, anyway. There are a lot of different ways to view communion, and we're going to talk about some of the major ways. It was, it was kind of cool. Actually, I got, a, I got a text from my dad this morning. He read the notes um, that Len posted last night. So if you want to cheat, like, you know how sometimes I ask for an answer? If you want to cheat, you can look at the Bible app early in the morning. And then you'll know the answer to any question that I'm asking, because the notes are already out there. But, um, but my dad said, hey, I read the notes, and he said, I don't know if I've seen uh, that comprehensive of a treatment of communion ever. And I was like, dude, you have been in the church a million years. Like, really? <laughs> and so anyway, so we're going to cover a lot of ground today, but, but I want to, I wanna, um, before we do that, I want to say this. This is a subject that I'm very passionate about. And so I hope that that comes through rather than just info. And it's something that we as a church are committed to and devoted to, and we want to understand how was the early church devoted to this, and how can we be more like that? Yes. So, so I'm going to cover a lot of ground, but I hope that it goes deep and doesn't just stay up here like, well, I learned some stuff. Like, so what? What are we going to do about it? How are we going to engage with the Lord through communion? Amen. Okay, so, so the first words that, that often we, we use for communion are the Lord's Supper. And, and it's called that because, because literally we picture Jesus as our host at the table as he was with his disciples at the Last Supper, instituting communion and saying, hey, everybody, 
this is my body broken for you. This is my blood given for you. And so the Lord's Supper is named that because it's bringing the Last Supper now to current time. So we relive that moment that he spent with them. And so some people call it the host or the blessed host because Jesus is the host, right? And, and because uh, and his body and blood. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But um, Jesus started the institution of the, the uh, Lord's Supper in the context of Passover. And so there are a couple of huge themes of Passover that just make sense. Remembering God's provision for the nation and their salvation, right? When the angel of death came, remember blood over the doorposts, and Jesus became the perfect Passover lamb. Remember John said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world right? And, and so he became the, the one that was led to the slaughter, Isaiah 53 talks about. And so there also are themes of new life and community and sacrifice and celebration. All that's part of Passover. And then Jesus brought it into our lives through communion. Now, a lot of believers and Messianic believers still keep Passover right up there at least once a year and celebrate it, and then they integrate communion into it. So the second uh, term that we use a lot is communion, and that is literally the word fellowship. And it means union and partnership and participation in Greek. And we talked about the word koine, koinonia, uh, means common. So it's what we have in common with each other. And we have communion with each other, and that happens through the Holy Spirit. It's not something that I just work really hard on, the Holy Spirit brings it about in our lives as we say yes and as we stop fighting against fellowship. Right so he draws us into oneness, and I think this is an interesting idea. The Holy Spirit loves you through someone else and through you loves someone else. And that strengthens the bond, that strengthens the, the family ties. So the Lord's Supper is a, a regular reminder of our our bond together, that we together are the body of Christ. So Jesus walked on the planet. Historical evidence would say, you know, you can't really argue that he was here. You can argue about what it means, but he walked around on the earth, and then he left, and he said, now through the Spirit, you are my body. You, we, are his body walking around. And so when we take communion, we remember, oh yeah, I'm part of this body. We together are now the body of Christ carrying forward what, what he challenged us to do, right? Amen. So it's like this vertical relationship and the horizontal relationship, which looks a lot like a cross. It's a good reminder that we're connected with him, we're connected to each other. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 10, I, I love, this is really some, some cool verses from St. Paul. He said, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation, that's the word koinonia, in the blood of Christ. And is not the bread that we break a participation, koinonia again, in the body of Christ? Because there's one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share in that one loaf. So when the bread is broken and we, we partake in that, it's a picture of the, the body that's broken coming back together in us. So the, the next word uh, is Eucharist, and literally it just means thanks or thanksgiving. And so that comes from that last supper when Jesus was with his disciples. It says he took the bread and he gave thanks. And then he said, this is my body. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks, Eucharisto, and then he distributed it to them. Now think about the context. He knows what's going to happen. He's going to the cross and he is giving thanks for that. He's giving thanks for being, being with his guys. He's giving thanks for instituting this communion uh, celebration with them. He's giving thanks for what the cross is going to accomplish. He's giving thanks for being together with them again someday. But he knows that it's going to be cut short and then restored later. He's giving thanks for all of that. That's what Eucharisto means. So the, the last one that we're going to talk about, and there are a few others, but these are the biggies. The last one is the blessed sacrament 
or the most blessed sacrament, which we get, you know, a lot of Catholic churches or uh, Episcopalian churches w- would use that. And, and it's called that because they are revering the body and blood of Christ mystically present in the bread and wine. And so that's why it is the most blessed sacrament. That's why it is lifted up and revered as really, really important. So uh, the, the, the fancy word for it is transubstantiation. You're welcome, Josh. Um, and so that means that literally the bread is transformed into the body of Christ, and the wine is transformed into the blood of Christ when the priest blesses it before the people come, and then it goes back to what it was before at the end of the Mass. Now, where does that come from? That comes from the verses where Jesus said, this is my body, and this is my blood. And it also comes from the verses where Paul says, be careful when you take communion, because if you take it in an unworthy manner, you're drinking judgment on yourself. And so people are like, wait a minute. So that's actually his body. That's actually his blood. Now, to, to uh, go big picture, do I believe that, that Jesus goes into the bread and then out of the bread? I struggle with that. But here's the thing that happens. Sometimes we overreact and we go, it's only symbolic. It's only bread from Costco. It's only juice from Trader Joe's. Like, no big deal. And I would say, now wait a minute. So then why would Paul say, be careful? So here's something that I, ha- I have been doing. I, I don't believe that Jesus comes and goes in bread. I believe he lives in us. And I believe we celebrate the risen Lord when we gather at his table and that we have to have reverence and awe when we come to his table. This is not my table. This is his table. And I, and I need this reverence and awe about the elements themselves. So something that makes me nuts is when people take the bread and dump it in the trash. And I'm like, hmm, you know? Or we take the wine and we dump it down the sink. And I'm like, no. So I always tell our people, take it outside and honor it. Like, if there's leftover bread, we let the birds of the air go after it. And if there's leftover wine or grape juice, we pour it outside where at least a tree is going to benefit. But let's, let's honor the whole process with the Lord. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, so I just pray that we as believers now don't fall into this trap of making it trivial, of making it unimportant, of making it just a, a, a meaningless ritual that, that somebody does at church. Because there is something remarkable that happens when we understand communion and we meet with the Lord at his table. He speaks to us. He, he meets with us. We can, we can sense his presence in a really unique way. And so I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I don't want to say the Catholics are all wet and we're not. I want to say, let's find this place of reverence and awe right and understand what the Lord is talking about. Amen? Amen? And the other thing that happened is when Paul says, don't drink it in an unworthy manner, he said, you must examine yourself. What he's not saying is, you need to be worthy to come up. Some people have taken it that far. No, it's the opposite. He's saying, you are not worthy. So don't come up here thinking you are. And make sure that you examine your heart and you examine your life and you say, Jesus, you are perfect and I am not, and I need you. And and if I understand that he gave me this gift of the table so that I can say thank you, and I have a, a grateful heart, and I understand the generosity and the forgiveness of God, and I understand that Jesus is the Savior who died, now I can come and take communion and I'm not taking it flippantly. It's interesting, too, that 2,000 years ago when Paul was chewing the believers out for taking communion wrong, he also got on them for not being unified. He said, some of you come and serve yourselves quick. Some of you get drunk at communion. Some of you take the place of honor. <laughs> really, they were getting drunk at communion. And, 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 then, and then some of you just like, you don't let the poor people come in. You, and he's like, wait a minute. This whole idea is that the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And, and 2,000 years ago, mealtime was pretty segregated. So there were people who ate a lot and ate early. They were wealthy. 
There were people who ate a little and ate late. They were poor. And there was, you know, husbands and wives and kids and neighbors and servants, and everybody ate at different times. And the position of importance at the table was the key. And man, I got to get there early so I get the meat. And then Paul says, no, not for you. You're believers in Christ. You are equal now. And so when you take communion, you honor and, and welcome each other. And it's more important for Len to take communion than me. And I want, I want to serve, each, we need to serve each other and, and be in it together and be unified because that's the whole picture of, of what that means. Amen. Right on? Amen. Okay. So um, we, I think it's interesting, too, that communion is using the most basic elements of the day, bread and wine. I mean, 2,000 years ago, that was just always and, and every meal. And it's interesting, too, Jesus calls himself the bread of life. And the context for that in John 6 is people are talking about manna from heaven, and they're like, you know, hey, could you bring us some of that like Moses did? And then Jesus goes, you're looking at him. And the people didn't get it. They're like, wait, what? He was saying, I am the bread from heaven. I am the provision for you. And, and I'm the bread that you'll never hunger again. So I'm... I'm better than manna. It's interesting, too, um, in the book of Acts, on the road to Emmaus, there's a couple of disciples after the crucifixion, and they're, lo- they're like lost spiritually, just wondering, like, what's going on? And then Jesus comes and walks with them. And then they t- you know, they, they, Jesus notices that they're kind of down, and he says, what's going on? And then they say, didn't you hear what's going on in Jerusalem about this guy that we thought was the Messiah, and then they killed him, and then there's rumors that he's alive, and then, 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 then. You remember this story? All right, so they're doing the Eeyore thing, right? <laughs> well, we thought he was the Messiah, <laughs> but I guess he's not. And he's walking with them. Like, so, so it's interesting, though, when, when they stopped for dinner, he broke the bread, and then they recognized him. And, and some people say, you know, they were so distraught that they didn't get it. This is a miracle. You know, God was hiding, you know, his identity from them. Or, but I think it's interesting that that moment of him breaking the bread must have unlocked all the other times that he broke the bread with them. And it was like, oh, it's him. And then he disappears. And then they run miles to Jerusalem. How many miles is it, Gary? Do you remember? It's a ways. So they, seven miles, they, he, they ran all the way to Jerusalem to say, like, good news, we've seen the Lord. And, and then the good news there in Jerusalem was, so have we. So it's pretty, pretty cool. So um, both bread and wine, think about this, are crushed in the process of being made. So the seeds, the, the kernels of wheat are ground, Right? completely destroyed in order to become flour. And think about what happens to grapes. I've always wanted to do that walking thing. Have any of you done that walking? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Do you wash your feet first? Okay, never mind. So, but, so, so think about these two, these two pictures are really destroyed and broken in the process of being made whole. And, and so Oswald Chambers uh, wrote, wrote these, these words. I don't know if it was original to him, but it became more popular a- after him. But Jesus was made broken bread and poured out wine for us, and he expects us to be made broken bread and poured out wine in his hands for others. Amen. So, whoa, let that just sit in you for just a minute. So Jesus allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be spilled as a sacrifice for people, right? And then we remember what he did, and he invites us into what? A similar way of living, where he says, take up your cross daily and follow me. And and he says, unless you do that, you're not going to be my disciple. Unless we do what? unless we allow our lives to be broken for others. Yeah, but I don't want to do that. He didn't really say, do you want to do this? Right? Right He said, come and follow me. 
And so part of following him is understanding that our lives will at times be broken and crushed for others. I, there was a, somebody um, fairly new to the church wrote on a Connect card a couple weeks ago, um, we're looking for a church that has other people with generous hearts because our generous hearts have been used up and abused at times. And we want to know how to live that out. That, that is the right question because it's not easy. And, and it's, it's this interesting dance where we open up our lives to people in need and we want to help them through stuff. And then at times they hurt us. And at times they don't do what they're supposed to do. And then we say, wait a minute. And, and the Lord leads us through these times in our lives where we gain discernment and he gives us new opportunities. And some people do it right and some people don't. Sounds a little like the disciples, doesn't it? And Jesus didn't go, well, you're not getting it. I am out. He didn't fire them. I would have fired them, right? I mean, think about it. They, they really did not fulfill their job description sometimes, and he could have fired them. But he kept pouring into them and kept teaching them so that they could lead and teach others. Amen. Okay. Um, so communion is a reminder that our lives are to be lived sacrificially as his was. And communion is also a couple of other things, too. It's a reminder of his sacrifice and his forgiveness. So when we come to the table, we're like, whoa. Think about how forgiven you are. Think about forgiven I am. It's a promise of his return. It's a means of fostering unity among us in the body. Uh, it also gives us thankfulness and gratefulness when we come up. It's just a constant reminder. If you don't take communion for a few months, I think you may become less grateful for his sacrifice. And then if you take communion a little more often, you might be like, oh, I'm feeling grateful for his sacrifice. Yeah. Amen. Um, it's also a, 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 a reminder that our daily sustenance is from him. So if I come and get my bread and my drink here, that's a reminder that all the other bread and drink that I get in my life is from him. In fact, some saints throughout history, did you know this? They lived on only communion for years. So this is a diet plan that can work very effectively for you. So Catherine of Siena, so in the 1300s, 25 years on communion. So that, that was, I mean, uncommon, yes, but there are dozens of saints that survived on only communion for a long time. Um, I was looking at a couple of, of quotes that I, that I really liked. So there's one from Mother Teresa about communion that I think is beautiful. When you look at the crucifix, you understand how much Jesus loved you then. When you look at the sacred host, that's communion, you understand how much Jesus loves you now. Amen. Woo! Isn't that good? And, and look at this one, um, St. Thomas Aquinas. The Eucharist is the consummation of the whole spiritual life. So he says it all comes together at that table. So you can make it more complicated. You can figure out all this other theological stuff, but he's like, just come there, and it's going to start making sense. St. Maximilian Colby, if angels could be jealous of men, it would just be for communion. That's interesting, right? So angels are probably not celebrating communion right now, and they're going to watch us take communion this morning, and the saint is saying they're jealous of you because you get to live out this life now and this act now, thanking him for who he is. Amen. Deep thoughts. I've had a couple of pretty amazing communion experiences over time. Uh, there was one time when I was at a, a conference called Centralized in Kansas City, and Stacy and I were there, and there were probably about a thousand people that were in attendance. And there was a band that was playing um, up on the stage, um, just some really, you know, mellow worship music. And we had about a half hour or 40 minutes to come and take communion in groups whenever we wanted to. It was just a time of reflection and prayer. And they had bread and wine from all over the world. And all, there were like six or seven tables around, just beautifully decorated. And it was the global body of Christ. There were people from all around the world at this conference. And the whole idea was, you are part of the global body of Christ. Let's take global communion. 
and, rep and recognize that people all over the world are celebrating the same thing we are right now. Remarkable. I remember being at Urbana, the missions conference in um, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and, and they had a tradition of taking communion at midnight on New Year's Eve. And so we were taking communion at New Year's Eve, and it was like, I think that one had like 15,000 uh, college students and a couple of us old people that they let in. And, and it was just incredible to see the hearts poured out in worship and the, the people coming down to the table crying and all these college students just pouring out their lives before the Lord. And, and at the conference, the challenge was, um, um, it was, does the gospel need to make it to the, the far reaches of the world where people have never heard? Yes. Who's going to take it? And are you willing to die taking it there? And that was really the, the moment of communion. It was unreal. And, and the challenge in, in that moment was ask Jesus what this means to him. It was just remarkable. And, and I remember kneeling at that table and taking communion and just saying, Jesus, show me. What is this to you? Who cares what I think? What, what does this mean to you? And I, and I had this remarkable meeting with the Lord that night where I felt like I understood his sacrifice just to a much deeper level where it's just the pain and the, the shame and the separation and the, just the agony. And man, the, communion is that. Communion isn't like, you know, hey, Len, good to see you at communion today. This is the Lord that we're meeting with together. And so Len and I come and we're like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and may this thank you just carry me through this week. Right on? Right on. Okay. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about the, the Last Supper and Jesus initiating communion. It's interesting, it's not in the book of John. We don't know why, but maybe John just thought, oh, it's already covered by the guys. I'm fine. Um, but 1 Corinthians 11 is where we have a whole bunch about communion, and that's where Paul is chewing out the church about doing it wrong. But he also has his instructions for doing it right. So we're going to look at that for a minute. So 1 Corinthians 11, 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So look at those verses for just a second. So do this in remembrance of me. We're looking back. So there's a past and a present and a future in these verses. We're looking back at what he has already done. And then it says, do this. Continue to do this. That's the present. Do this together is now. And then we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes as the future. So there's something that happens in communion where all of time, like 2,000 years plus of time, is, is right here in this table where we're carrying forward the tradition. It's interesting, too, that Paul says, I received from the Lord. Wait a minute. He was not one of the original 12. He did not receive the Lord's Supper at the Last Supper. How did he receive this from the Lord? We don't know. But we do know that Paul was tuned in with Jesus, who appeared to him on the road, and evidently appeared to him a couple times. And at some point, the Lord must have said, Hey, Paul, this is really important. I want you to teach this to the people. Pretty cool. So communion is about the past because we look back and remember what Jesus did for us. And here's an element uh, that, that occurred to me this week about how it's the present. Thank Jesus for his life in you now. So when you come up to the table, it's not like he's over there and I'm over here. You're coming in the power and presence of Jesus, hosted by him at the table, to meet with him through the Spirit with each other. Like, be grateful and be thankful and be blown away by that. Like, he'll welcome us. He filled us with his Spirit, yeah. And we get to take communion with him. 
in real time now? Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then we look forward to the future, and, and it says we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So picture what it's going to be like in the future to be in heaven at this wedding supper of the Lamb that Scripture talks about, to be whooping it up in heaven. Like, how many of you have been to a really cool wedding reception? Okay, so Sierra's was really good. I mean, that was really fun. But I, but I feel like that's just a little scratch. We're scratching the surface of the party that the Lord has planned for us someday. And, and when, he, when, he did, uh, when he instituted, instituted the Lord's Supper with his guys at the Last Supper, he said, I'm not going to drink the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. So he said, there's going to be a little pause on my celebration with you like this in person but I can't wait until we get together and you won't believe what it's going to be like, is what he was saying. Right on. So I want to welcome the band to come on back up. And I want to encourage you to just picture often what that wedding party will be like. What will that look like? I was going to have a picture of a bride and a groom up there. Because, I mean, at a wedding party, you've got a bride and groom, right? And so the picture of Jesus throughout the New Testament is as the bridegroom. And, and then John the Baptist was the best man. And so what's it going to be like for us to be the bride? I, I don't know if you knew this, but I spent a little time writing. I took a sabbatical a number of years back, and I wrote, um, uh, had about six weeks off, and I wrote a short you know, book that was called Being the Bride. Because as men, it's a little hard for us to figure that out. Like, what does it mean to be the bride? What is it? It's easier for ladies, I think, to figure this out. But, but what does it mean for us to be reunited with the Lord someday? And he is, he is the groom, and we are the bride, and we're together with him forever. And there's big celebration. He's welcoming us into meditating on that and, and leaning into that truth together and saying, Lord, we don't need to understand all of it, but we need to be excited about it and, and trust you with it. So as we celebrate communion together, I wanted to ask you this. What do you need to say to the Lord? Assuming this is his table, assuming he is welcoming you and welcoming us to it, what do you want to say to him? Don't think about anybody else. Just think about you and him. Be thankful for everybody else. But just say, Lord, what do you, what do you want to hear from me? What, what should I say to you? How should I respond to you? based on what we've talked about, the truth that we've been working through today. And, and examine yourself. Maybe you've been real flippant about communion and it's time to be serious and go like, man, this is meaningful. Forgive me, Lord, for not taking this seriously, but for the rest of my time with you, Jesus, until we meet in person, help me to be committed and excited about being with you in this way. And as you come up, Please keep this vertical relationship in mind that he's welcoming you to his table. Picture him here. And that you're coming together with other sons and daughters to the table of the king. And I want to encourage you this way. Don't go quick. We, uh, we have some friends who put together this beautiful table today so that you can take your time and linger. And so, is it gluten-free, Linda? So everything is gluten-free up here. Thank you. And, uh, and so intinction is what we, uh, what we learned from the Orthodox Church, but you can take a piece of bread and dip it in the juice and linger and, and take time praying and just focus on the Lord. There's also um, communion cups here that you can take back to your seat if you want to do it that way. Those are also gluten-free. But I just want to encourage you to just take time. Both sides of the table are open. Linger, pray experience the Lord, tell him what you want to tell him this morning, and spend some time listening as well. And then over on this side, your connect cards are going to go here, and offerings and tithes go over there. And then if you would like to give your time as an offering, those are the volunteer opportunities over on that side. So this is your time with the Lord. The band's going to play instrumental for a few minutes. So just, uh, just, Sit with the Lord, 
Tell him what you want to tell him. Listen to what he wants to tell you and come take communion when you're ready. Okay?